And welcome to episode 9 of the David Bernard Podcast. Today is June 10th, 2021. I'm joined with Zach Fredella now, my fellow Fox 8 meteorologist. And Zach, we did it. We got through the first week of hurricane season without a storm. Quite an accomplishment. Especially after what has happened the past several years where we've had multiple preseason storms. And then right when we've hit June 1st, we've had something to watch. But this week, pretty quiet. Uh, but that might change as we go into the middle part of June. There are some hints that we could be watching something way down in the Caribbean, but overall a quiet start to hurricane season. We love it. And, and you know, we just passed the one year anniversary of Cristobal. That was a year ago. OK, so that was like around June 8th or something when that landfall started. And we thought, oh, my gosh, we're already having a storm the first week of June. And who knew what would be ahead of us uh, over the next several months? But, you know, one of the worst hurricane seasons on record. Yeah, I mean, 2020 brought the 30 named storms. And usually, typically, we always talk about this. If you get a storm in June, that doesn't equate to, oh, we're going to have a busy season. Uh, just so happens that last year, it was one of those really busy, hyperactive seasons. So, yeah, you're probably going to get some early season development. But uh, this year, you always tell me, you always say it, every other year, typically, we get that June storm. So last year, we got a June storm. Hopefully, we don't get one this year. <laughs> But that might still happen. Well, so there was a little bit of the Hurricane Center outlooked an area in the Caribbean earlier this week. Uh, never really looked like that was going to be much to me. And I think you felt the same way. And of course, they've now taken that off the table for development. Uh, but why is it that we typically see these storms spin up around the uh, Caribbean or particularly around Central America uh, this time of the year? It's all because of the way the wind blows from the Pacific Ocean, from the Caribbean and the Gulf. There's always this weak area of low pressure that develops over Central America. That's why at this time of year, they're almost always highlighting something down there. And the technical name for it is the Central American gyre, uh, which we usually when we get those early season storms, it's a piece of that that comes off of that area of low pressure, that broad area of low pressure. And so we always have to watch that area. And that might be what we're watching as we go into the middle of the month. And that, that became the buzzword last year, the Central American <laughs> gyre that really got out there in the public sphere. It was like the polar vortex of winter, right? Uh, something that we've known forever that has existed, uh, but you know, that has not really been in the public lexicon uh, for quite some time. Uh, so anyway, the Central American Gyre, it's basically a big area of broad, low pressure. And occasionally you'll get something spinning off of that and uh, developing a storm. Uh, there are model hints that that still might happen. I, yeah, I was just looking at them a second ago. Every, every day we get multiple models. And that's why, you know, there's so many things that you see out there in social media land and whatnot that you can't latch on to one single model that's talking about something seven to ten days away. That's what we sit here and we look at all these models and we get the feel that, okay, well, something might happen, but we're not talking about, hey, it's coming to Louisiana or, hey, it's going to Florida. Just there's going to be a tropical dis disturbance that's going to sit down there. And whatever happens, we really don't know what's going to happen in the long run. But right now, that's certainly going to be that area to watch over the next week or two. And, and you know, the big, the big, I don't say, I want to say fight, but dilemma, I guess you could say, the big dilemma uh, that we sort of face as broadcast meteorologists over the last 20 years, uh, and is specifically really the last 10 or so, has been uh, the acceleration of social media and the amount of information available to the public. And uh, I get questions all the time, you do too, from our viewers saying, hey, we saw this on this model, or Joe Smith from Channel Wherever posted this. And what I have found is that I can't go down and chase down everybody else's social media. I can't go out and put out every fire that I think is uh, maybe hyperbolic or uh, maybe just even scientifically untrue. Unfortunately, uh, that kind of stuff gets out there as well. All we can do is control our own individual messages. You have a big following on social media, and I, I think you know I kind of follow the same path along with the rest of our team, is that we'll put the information out there. We can't hide it. I mean, anybody with Google can go and look for this kind of stuff, but the best we can do is give the proper perspective for what the threat is at this time, if there's even a threat. Exactly, and that's the problem. It, there's no threat right now, absolutely no threat to anybody uh, from this possibility of a disturbance, but it looks threatening when you see a model that might be pointing towards you 10 days out without any type of meteorological context. Oh, that looks threatening, but the reality is, is 10 days out, that model is not going to get that right. 
and that storm might end up in the Pacific Ocean when all is said and done. And that's why there's no real need to post individual model runs every single day. Because look, we get these models four times a day and we have multiple models. So it just becomes, a, like you said, you know, going down a rabbit hole that it's not worth it. And, and the bottom line is, and we kind of beat this into the ground, people are sick of hearing it, but you need to be ready any time of the year, beginning now, going all the way through October, as we saw last year, with Zeta <laughs> hitting uh, practically around uh, Halloween. Well, remember, uh, you can also watch this podcast. We have a video version. It's on our website, fox8live.com slash David. And uh, if you happen to be watching the video version now, we have the audio version on our website. And of course, you can also subscribe to it on just about any podcast app. We're on uh, just about all of them, whatever you get on your phone, Apple, etc., Spotify, uh, you can find us there. Don't forget FoxAlive.com along with Fox 8 News and Weather Apps uh, where you can stream our newscast all throughout the year. Uh, if you don't happen to be in front of your TV and a lot of people don't live like that anymore. Also, it's a very good tool to have have during a hurricane. We saw this with Zeta last year, 90% power outage in the metro area. If you have a way to keep your tablets and phones charged, that might be your car, but you also don't want to start running your gas down charging the car because who knows what the gas tank situation could be if we have a real storm. Uh, but if you have a portable battery, a portable battery charger, a way to keep your devices charged, you'll be able to continue watching us uh, through the storm as well. And uh, also this year, uh, we're on our iHeart radio station network. They are our partners. And I had a lot of people tell me during Zeta when the power went out, they went to the good old fashioned terrestrial radio and uh, turned into iHeart radio and they were able to uh, hear our uh, coverage there. Well, today we are speaking uh, with a friend of mine and somebody who is very well known in the meteorological community and beyond, I would say, the worldwide public as well. Uh, that is uh, Josh Morgerman. And Josh is, I would call him probably the premier hurricane chaser in the world because the guy is international, all right? I mean, we've got some really good hurricane chasers, professionals uh, that you know, Zach, and we work with around, but, but Josh has taken it uh, to the next level. And I'll get him to confirm this, uh, but at least by way of his website, he has intercepted, it appears, 59 storms around the globe. Of those, five were Category 5 storms and eight Category 4 storms, uh, the rarest and most intense of all storms. Uh, uh, quite a remarkable feat. So on that note, uh, let's bring in Josh. Josh, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here. Well, um, we're going to start talking mainly about what I think are two of your most intense chases uh, you've had in your career here of doing this. And we're going to back into eventually how you do it and how you got started and all of that. Uh, but I think we want to hear about Haiyan and Dorian, which uh, you can correct me, but I think those were probably two of your more intense experiences uh, that you've had. I want to start with Haiyan and remind everybody out there, this was in the Philippines in 2013. Uh, this was a Category 5 storm, 190 mile per hour winds. I believe at the time the most intense landfall based on wind uh, at the time, it set the record. I, I believe there was a typhoon last year uh, that might have broken that record. You probably know better than I do. I've never been in anything close to that. Most people haven't experienced that. What was that like? Yeah, uh, you got it right. First off, you know, when I talk about what my top chases are, I actually made a top 10 list last year and, and I really had to think about which was the top? Was it Super Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines or was it Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas? Dorian eked it out by a hair, but yeah, Haiyan was, uh, was an absolutely historic storm. As you said, uh, at the time of landfall, it was, this, it was the strongest uh, landfalling tropical cyclone in world history based on estimated winds of landfall. Uh, there, actually, there was another hurricane or typhoon, excuse me, that tied it that because it passed over a remote uh, Philippines island a couple of years later. And then, as you said, the record might have been broken last year. However, uh, the Joint Typhoon Warning Center hasn't done post analysis on that one yet. So whether that record was broken or not, it remains to be seen. But yeah, Haiyan, I'm sorry, I'm nerding out on the stats, uh, you know, from the human impact, the thing was off the charts. You know, it, it wasn't just that it was a category five. 
but it made the inner core of it made a direct hit on a pretty big city, uh, a city of 220,000 people uh, called Tacloban City. And not only that, imagine that, imagine a very dense city of that size, mm -hmm. basically at sea level or just a little above on the tip of a peninsula at the top of a narrow bay. And so what happened was the typhoon, which was a category five, the, the eye passed just south of the city. They were in that right front quad. All that wind funneled an um, unbelievable amount of water into this narrow bay and it just overflowed into the city like a tsunami. Now we think of storm surges coming up gradually, it usually does. You know, I think about Hurricane Ike in Texas, you know, the storm surge was coming up two days before, you know, it was coming up. It was a very gradual thing. It was a devastating storm surge, but it came up over the course of days. With Super Typhoon Haiyan, it was the opposite. It was a very small typhoon, it moved very fast. Right before the typhoon, the water actually pulled out of the bay. It was actually, the, the tide went down. And then all of a sudden during, at the height of the storm, it just rushed into the city like a tsunami. So the suddenness was part of why thousands of people died in the space of an hour. And, and that's, that's what I was gonna say when you just described that about the water being pulled out. That's not normally how storm surge uh, reacts. It just tells you how ferocious uh, this actually was. Um, at that any point, did you feel your life was in danger in this storm? Did you, or were you able to move positions or were you sheltered the entire time? You know, what's interesting with that one is I, 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 I felt personally safe, but what freaked me out was I, the people, people all around me were going to die. And so what I mean is I was in a, a very strong hotel um, at, at the highest point of the city, which was maybe like about 19, feet above sea level. Um, but even even the hotel went underwater. The storm surge just came up and the whole first floor of the hotel was underwater. I was on the second floor or third floor uh, trying to sh shoot the storm, which we were in the eye wall, so it was just crazy. And this was in a dense urban area. So you had category five winds ricocheting off buildings, just blowing debris in every direction. I mean, it was really scary, but the water came up all of a sudden. And what happened was, there were folks on the first floor and by the time they realized what was happening, the water was so high that they couldn't open the doors to their rooms. So they were, they were in their rooms with the water coming up and they couldn't get out and, and, oh. and they were in the windows and screaming. And I, I, I literally, I felt the way I did on nine 11 when you're watching the towers and you're seeing people at the top of the burning buildings and they're, they're just like helpless. They can't do anything. And you're like, wow, you're watching people die. So I and a couple other guys just like, jumped in the water and just like swam across the courtyard and started pulling them out of the windows and putting them on mattresses and, and sort of ferrying them to the, uh, the lobby, which was also underwater, to get them on a staircase to get them to the second floor. And I'm very happy to say no one in our hotel actually died. There were some injuries, but, but we got it right to the second floor in time. But that's what freaked me out about that one. I thought I was going to see people die in front of me. Well, and, and Zach, you, you can chime in on this. What are you thinking about when you're hearing that story? I'm thinking about Katrina. I think you need to unmute your mic. Uh, I didn't experience that personally, but that's exactly the thought process when it comes to Hurricane Katrina. And, you know, that's exactly what all of the people that did stay behind and, you know, the lower ninth ward and places like that. You know, they, they experienced that same thing where they had to get in their attic and the water kept rising and they had to get so, out some kind of way. So let me ask you this, uh, Josh. Thousands of people lost their lives in this storm. Once it was over, what was it like getting out of there? I've never been, I've been in many hurricanes um, by that point, I'd not been in one like that where the level of destruction, it was just like, I mean, whole huge sections of the city were just gone. I don't mean they were damaged. I mean, they were just piles of rubble. It looked like what you see after an EF5 tornado. Like you couldn't even find the streets and their bodies. I mean, I don't want to get gross about it, but it was it was really horrible. And there was and there was a, a, a complete breakdown of services and civil order. And uh, it, it was a, it was a, it just a complete apocalypse, you know, and um, there's so many confused emotions you have. I mean, of course, you're, you're just witnessing, witnessing human suffering like that, you know, I, I, like just seeing like injured children and things just like it just it like it, it's really hard to grasp, you know, and, and then the, the other stuff is 
you're seeing all this misery, but then you're like, all right, how am I going to survive this? You know, I'm in a, a developing country on the other side of the planet. The, the infrastructure is completely broken down and I don't know how I'm going to get out of here or when. Uh, well, what I've learned, I actually learned some survival skills in, in high end, which I've applied, uh, you know, to other chases since. And the one thing I've gotten really good at is when, when I get into a really bad crisis situation like that level, like just serious hardcore crisis i've learned how to just shut my emotions off i just kind of turn into like a i can't explain i just shut my emotions off i just turn into like sort of a zombie i get really task oriented it's like right like i just map out what i need to do you know what's step one what's step two and just focus on the task shut off the emotions and you know you could feel things later and what's interesting is I, i i basically shut off my emotions but once i got back to la and i was home and i was safe I would watch stuff about the typhoon on on TV and I would start to cry looking at the human suffering. I didn't cry while I was there. I cried after when I when I was in kind of a, a place where I could, you know, where, where, I, where I can have emotions. But while I was there, it was like, you know, I, I couldn't go down that hole. I had to just stay focused. You know, and before we talk about uh, Dorian and Zach's going to get into that, when you just brought that up, it brought up memories in my mind when I ended up coming here for Katrina. Uh, I had left New Orleans six weeks before Katrina to move to Miami for a job with CBS there, and they sent me back here to cover it. And the suffering that I saw in these five days after the levee breaks was just, it was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. But I wasn't really reacting to it, and it wasn't until I got out of there and ended up in Houston to kind of recuperate for a week that I really took on the full scale of this. And of course, this went on for me for a period of a year. I had basically survivor's guilt is what I was told, especially since I was so personally connected to people that lost their homes, lost their businesses. So I imagine that's maybe a little bit of what you were experiencing. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's a confused mix of feelings. And also, you know, that's it. We're, we're talking about the human side. Then there's my other side. You know, there's my, my total weather nerd side, which was fascinated by this spectacle I just witnessed. You know, like like it, it was just everything about that, that typhoon. Literally, it was an awesome spectacle. Awesome in the old sense of the word, not awesome like yeah. good. And and. And, and so there was that, you know, I was just fascinated by the data I'd collected in it and the, 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 the dimensions and metrics around that storm. So I just, it, a lot of emotions around Haiyan for me still, you know, eight years later. Hard to believe it's in that long. Zach, uh, you want to talk about Dorian? Yeah, let's sort of switch gears here because you said, I was sort of surprised by this. You said Dorian was your number one. That's your number one, you know, chase that's on your top 10. And just to remind everybody when Dorian, Dorian was 2019. It was a storm that moved into the Bahamas, another Cat 5, 185 miles per hour. So slightly weaker than Haiyan. Uh, But one of the big things with Dorian, number one, it's the worst disaster that's ever hit the Bahamas. Uh, But it was the slow movement of that storm and basically a stall that happened, you know, right over, I think it was Grand Bahama that it stalled over, but Great Abaco was the first island it impacted. And where were you exactly for that storm? So I was in Marsh Harbor, which is sort of the de facto capital of Great Abaco Island where it first made landfall. So uh, Marsh Harbor, it's, you know, the capital, but it's it's a town of uh, about 6,000 people. So it's not large, but it is the main population center. The eye of Dorian made landfall right there. It passed right over that town. And as you said, sustained winds at landfall were 185 miles an hour. So that ties it for first place as the strongest landfalling hurricane on record in North America. It actually ties the Labor Day hurricane of 1935 that hit the Florida Keys. So that was real history. The reason it it felt uh, to me worse than high end, in high end, the the eye passed just south of me and I was in the eye wall, the, the intense inner core, but the absolute maximum winds probably passed a couple of miles south of me. In, uh, in the southern part of Tacloban City. In Dorian, I just punched right through that center, right through the eyewall into that eye. So I just went through the absolute worst. And for your listeners who have been through bad hurricanes, they've noticed, you know, you get in the eyewall, which is the intense inner ring of, 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 of the strongest winds and heaviest rain. 
But there's actually a difference between the outer part of the eye wall and the inner part. I've noticed that in a lot of hurricanes, the most violent part is that last little bit before you get in the eye. It, it's like it's like the inner, inner part of the eyes where things go really nuts. And with Dorian, I went through that part. So so there was that. And then the the thing about Dorian, you know, Tacloban City in the Philippines, this is a city of 220,000 people. You know, a lot of it was still standing after that that storm. Marsh Harbor was this little town of 6,000 people. I mean, it just got absolutely flattened by this thing. Um, and, and like Haiyan, um, I was stuck there for days and kind of witnessed a similar level of just extreme human catastrophe. Now, what, what, what does a Category 5 storm sound like? I mean, a lot of my listeners uh, have been through a Category 1 maybe a few Category 2s. If you were on the Gulf Coast, you had a Category 3 with Katrina, but not very many people have heard or experienced or felt uh, a storm of that intensity. Yeah, the sound of a hurricane. So, so as you guys probably know, uh, but I'll explain it for people who haven't been in a hurricane, every hurricane sounds different and it's not just the intensity it there are other factors too it's like what's the landscape like underneath it are you in an urban area are you in the middle of a field are there telephone wires there's all kinds of stuff and certain hurricanes have like a very howly sound and other ones have a roar some sound like a scream like some sound very shrill um you know like like some are louder than others it's interesting it's not always correlated with intensity uh Dorian was a full on roar, uh, you know, and the interesting thing when we were in that inner eye wall, so I wrote it out. I am Dor once Dorian got as strong as it did, I realized I had to handle this one really carefully and I, I, I chased it with some level of caution. So I, I just I relocated. I was I was actually going to be in a condo very close to the water and once it like went nuclear. I actually found a school on a hill. <laughs> so I was like, all right, I'm really gonna, I, I wanna survive this thing, you know? I I'm, you know, I'm an edgy chaser, I like to be a daredevil, but I was like, I don't wanna die in this thing. So I wrote it out in a classroom in a school, concrete building, just a small room with 11 people. And uh, with all the, the storm sh cyclone shutters over the windows, and uh, you know, I just remember at the height of the storm, when we were in that inner eye wall. First of all, we're, I was looking out a window on the downwind side of of the of the room, and one thing about it is everything just turned white. You you couldn't. It was the middle of the day. You think I would have gotten incredible footage? But I might as well have shot a white shower curtain. Like you just you couldn't. There were cars parked. 20 feet away you couldn't see them everything just turned white and there was a roar and then the other thing was your ears everyone in the room our ears were killing us and it's not the low pressure of the storm people think it's that it's not that when you're in a on an airplane you're in lower pressure it's it, it, the pressure changes from the from these gusts over 200 miles an hour hitting the building they cause these rapid pressure changes and you can feel you feel like your ears are going to blow out and it was the worst i've ever had at dorian and everyone in the room was just like ow um well so what was crazy was everything just turned white and then when the white curtain lifted as we got into the eye and the sun came out just everything looked crazy just cars thrown all over the parking lot like toys just just nutty stuff but you didn't see any of the cars fly because you couldn't see anything while we were really in it so it's like a it was like a tornado. I, I think one thing, yeah, one thing I wanted to emphasize to everybody out there, uh, and having spent ten years in Miami, becoming very familiar with the Bahamas, how much worse this could have been for the Bahamas. The Bahamas, they're a huge island chain, right? I mean, seven or eight hundred miles long. It's very long chain. Uh, and, and Dorian hit a great Abaco, as you said, and then it hit Grand Bahama. Now, Great Abaco, I think, had 10 to 20,000 residents, something like that. Grand Bahama has like 50,000. Grand Bahama, I believe, is the second most populous island in the Bahamas. But almost everyone in the Bahamas, the majority live on Nassau, where a lot of Americans have gone uh, to the resorts there. You have a quarter of a million people or so on Nassau, and this storm missed it. I don't know what this nation would meaning the Bahamas would be today if that track had been farther to the south. Oh, it's it's hard to get your head around it. Exactly. I mean, and, and I should say even on Grand, even Grand Bahama, I don't want to say they, they got lucky, but the main 
town on Grand Bahama, which I think is Freeport, it looked like it was a little outside of the, it's on the west end of the island. It looked like it missed the absolute worst of it. So, so the, the, the Marsh Harbor, that, that town of 6,000 was, I think, the sort of population cluster that hit, like that hit Nassau. Wow. I mean, we're talking like a totally different uh, story here. You know, and that's what made Super Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines so unique. Not only was it the strongest landfall in history, but it made a perfect bullseye hit on a city of 220,000 and one that was uniquely vulnerable given its location and elevation. Okay, so the storm is over. Now what? <laughs> Yeah, so so I, I applied my my what I learned from Haiyan. I it, it was like Haiyan in the sense that it was that level of like off the charts catastrophe where you see a society totally break down, mass casualties, uh, you know. And I just I just realized, you know, I'm like, all right, I'm just going to be stuck here for a while and just try to just kind of be zen about it you know uh you know i i just yeah i think aside of me i started to get a little freaked out and then like the other voice in my head was like hey you know you want to be the big shot that goes and hunts down category fives and you know developing island nations you know <laughs> this is what this is part of it you know deal with it so i just calmed down and i just kind of you know i developed a system i lived in my car for a few days uh, my car was fine it was really interesting the car next to mine just totally blew away but mine had like not a scratch <laughs> So it was functioning, which was great. I meant to say during the eye of Orion, um, the, build, the room we were in was so, the school was so badly damaged that the 11 people I was with who I didn't know, we had to find somewhere else to go during the eye. And between the 11 or 12 of us, we only had three functioning cars, one of them being mine. So a bunch of people piled into my car and then two others, and we found a government building before the backside hit. So that was really scary. But so I had a functioning car, which was really good. And it allowed me to actually, while I was there, one, it, it was my was where I lived. I lived in the car and I kept it really clean and nice. And, you know, just that's the key to survive is just stay organized, create a sense of order in your space, stuff like that. Don't feel, don't feel chaotic. You know, I rationed my supplies very carefully. And since I had a car, it was able to be helpful. You know, I, I was, um, I brought one family to their house where they could get their things because their house had been destroyed. I took another guy to the medical clinic. I just tried to be useful while I was there and just, you know, and just, I knew it, you know, at some point I'll get off the island. And I did a, a couple, a few days later. Okay, so now let's pull it all back. So how did Josh Morgan become hurricane man, hurricane chaser uh, extraordinaire? You're not a meteorologist by training. Uh, Correct. You're, you're, you're a businessman, uh, but that didn't stop uh, you getting the hurricane bug. Uh, what do you trace it all back to? What, what was your aha moment, let's say? Well, you know, I think a lot of us, we're, you know, we're talking, you know, before we went live and you know, talking with Zach and he was sharing his experiences growing up and, and they were similar to mine. And I think a lot of weather nerds, I, I think it's something you're just born with it. I think it's like a gene, you know, you just get excited by, you know, violent weather. I could just remember being a toddler and, you know, any kind of thunder or wind or anything, I just get like excited, like it was a drug. And I grew up on Long Island and we would get hurricanes on occasion, um, you know, uh, weakening ones, but we would get hurricanes up there and I would just get very excited every time one would come. And, uh, you know, I, so that's what I think created the bug. And, and, you know, the big one I remember is when I was a teenager was Hurricane Gloria, which I was 15 years old. I was like a full on weather nerd by this point, you know, with my tracking maps and everything. And that one raced right up the East Coast and, and literally the center of it passed right over my town. It was just like, oh, my God, it was like, you know, like nerd heaven. But what was interesting, it was the first time I dealt with with my conflicting feelings about hurricanes. So I'm all excited. This thing's coming up. I'm like, yeah. And, uh, you know, the house starts shaking and the wind's really going crazy. And then we lost a really, really big tree. We had, and we had some other damage. And my mother started to cry. You know, she got very upset. She loved that old tree and there was other damage. And, you know, I, I, that's the worst thing in the world to see your mom cry. And I suddenly just, you know, my dad looked at me and said, is this what you wanted? And, and <laughs> no, it's, it's a moment that's burned in my memory, you know, and it was, and it was, you know, you cut to, you know, decades later, Super Typhoon Haiyan. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely enraptured with this atmospheric spectacle. And yet, you know, you're seeing uh, dead people and suffering. And it's like the, there are these two sides of my mind. And there's the human side that, that really feels the pain. And then there's the, 
you know, and then there's the, the, the side that's just absolutely awestruck by this, this spectacle on them. And I admit, I'm very obsessed. People ask me, you know, do you chase other kinds of weather? And I always say, no, I don't sleep around. You know, I'm only hurricanes. Uh, you know, I like to really be a specialist in one thing and that's what I do, you know, and I'm really, I'm, I'm specifically obsessed with hurricanes. It's just, it's been my life's calling. I've been in 55, which is a, a the eye walls of 55 hurricanes and typhoons. That's a world record. And I, you know, I add about five to seven a year. Okay. So I, we were I, talking, I, we were, we were talking before the break that my first one was George. That was my first one that actually came to me just like glory would be for you. What yes. out of those 55, which one, what is your first one that you actually chased? You actually went to and found your way into. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to age myself here. So great question. So, so there were a couple that came to me as a kid. And then the first one I chased was Bob in 1991. I was really young. So I was in college and I was, um, I was doing an internship on Capitol Hill in Washington, DC. And there was a hurricane coming up the coast. And remember this is before internet. This is before mobile phones. This is like before all that. This is like when you, you had to call a special hurricane center number to get the latest coordinates. And it was like crazy. No, imagine that we lived like that. All of us, so you, you don't remember this act, but it was crazy. This was like the, the era of horse-drawn carriages so 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 get this i was too i didn't have a car i was too young to rent a car so i so i knew it was going to hit up in like long island or new england so i i put you know some clothes in a duffel bag and like 200 dollars in like a paper map and again this is people didn't have devices back then no one had a phone or an ipad or anything you just you didn't have any of that stuff and I just jumped on a train to New York. And then in New York City, I jumped on a, to another train that went along the Connecticut coast. They chased this thing in a train with a paper map. <laughs> and that was, that was my first chase. Hey, so that's how it rolled. I ended up Rhode Island on a train as the, 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 the core of the hurricane was sort of raking the coast. And that was my first chase. And it's like, I look back at it. I'm like, oh, my God, I can't believe. Like, uh, how sad don't, and don't worry about aging yourself, Josh, because I think I'm about six months older than you. So, uh, OK, so um, I, I'm the old one. Uh, here, well, let's talk about the chase and 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 and, and how you plan for these things. Um, you're normally you're based in L.A., uh, Los Angeles, you know, we say L.A. and Louisiana, we have to specialize, the, you know, right. that L.A., not this L.A., uh, in Los Angeles, which, you know, theoretically, that's a great spot because, you know, it's a major city. You can jump to the Gulf Coast, the East Coast like that. And then when you get your crazy bug and you have to go typhoon chasing in the Pacific, obviously, Los Angeles is the gateway uh, to Asia from the United States. But 2020 happened. And so it was a little bit different last year for you. Yeah, exactly. And, and you correctly pointed out that L.A. is the perfect spot for me and what I do. Folks, some folks don't realize they, they joke. They're like, "Why wow, you live in L.A., you don't get hurricanes. But as you pointed out, if I'm chasing globally, if I'm chasing the Caribbean, East Asia, Australia, LA is actually the perfect point. No, we don't get hurricanes, but you have like you're, you have a nonstop flight to all those spots. But last year, I did suddenly realize, wow, you know, the, the, the world is cut off to me. My world is now much smaller. And I realized I was basically confined to North America. And I decided to just uh, mix it up. You know, I didn't want to, one, I didn't want to get on flights. And two, I just wanted to do something new. So I found me a house and uh, I, I decided, okay, I looked at I looked at a map of the U.S. and I'm like, all right, I'm probably going to be stuck in the U.S. this year. So where do I like to chase? And I'm like, all right, basically my, my chase zone is South Texas, all the Gulf Coast down to South Florida, and then up to like North Carolina. That That's for me the sweet spot. Stuff north of there, I don't mean to be a snob. I, you know, I did grow up on Long Island, but... These days, the up there don't quite do it for me. Those aren't hard enough drugs for me, okay? <laughs> like, it's like <laughs> so, I know I'm so, I'm just snob now toward Yankee hurricanes. It's like I forget I'm a Yankee. So, so, so I looked at that zone from basically South Texas, South Florida to uh, to North Carolina, and I said, okay, where's where's a point? Where's a midpoint there? from which I can drive to any possible chase, whether it's Port Isabel, Texas, uh, you know, Homestead, Florida, you know, uh, Moorhead City, North Carolina, and that was Mississippi, Mississippi coast. So I started looking for houses in Mississippi and I found a house to rent in Bay St. Louis. And that's where I ended up. 
so it was sort of initially by chance. It was just that I was like, okay, this is a midpoint on a map. I've since developed a very strong affection for the Mississippi coast and for Bay St. Louis specifically. I'm like a dog. I get very territorial. I lived there for five months. Now it's like, it's my turf. Okay. Like this is like, this is my town. So yeah. So it was really exciting. So, so I have to admit, like, I don't like, I don't talk about this a lot, but chasers are like athletes and you have burnout. And I think leading up to, to 2020, I was a little burned out on flat, like all these like 14 hour flights to Taiwan and you get in a car and you're like driving, and you can't read the signs and everyone like, you know, you can't communicate because you don't speak Chinese. I was the, the kind of the rat race of chasing around the world was starting to get to me. And so in a sense last year to just change pace, live in a little house on the Gulf coast, no planes, no airports, driving to every chase, road tripping. Man, it was so cool. It was so cool. And to live in hurricane country, to live right on the Gulf and just to experience it with, with residents, not just as an outsider, it was really cool. I mean, I know it wasn't you, cool for residents you, to be insensitive. You, you, you were the problem last year because you know what? The globe then knew, Mother Nature knew, <laughs> hey, we're just going to send them all towards him because he doesn't want to get on a plane anymore. Dude, don't say that. Like, I was scared that the locals were gonna like, you know, show up at the house with pitchforks and torches and like burn them with a stake, you know? Because like, I was, actually, up until Zeta, okay, I'm in Mississippi and and everyone's like, wow, you're a hurricane magnet. I'm like, no, I'm not. Mississippi kept getting missed. I was like, they'd go to the east or they'd go to the west. I'm like, I'm a protective agent. And then Zeta nailed Mississippi. So then I that that claim that I made. <laughs> water, water. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, you're over here on the causeway. They had uh, last year, you know, or I don't remember which year it was. You know, the old Jim Cantori, please go home, uh, sign because that's been the old joke with Jim, right? If he, wherever he shows up, you know, doom and gloom. So we don't want you to get that reputation, Joss, uh, by any means. Um, hey, for the technological geeks out there, give us an idea of of. What do you take with you on a chase? Like, what are the necessities? And I bet that has grown exponentially in the last 10 or 15 years just by the type of capabilities that we have today. In some ways, it may be easier. Yeah, it is. Now, different chasers do it different ways. And there are some chasers who are constantly, like, like just innovating with their gadgetry. And they have, like, more and more equipment and stuff. And you look at, like, um, Reed Timmer. You know, he's constantly innovating with, like, new ways of measuring atmospheric events. Uh, Mark Suddeth is another one. You know, he's really, like... He's really he has all kinds of instrumentation and stuff. Me, I'm a um, one thing is I don't I don't do like the team thing. I'm a, I'm a lone wolf. I like to chase alone. Sometimes I chase with one other one other guy. There's like there's I have one friend in Mexico that I will chase with sometimes. Another dude in Texas, but generally I'm like a solo act, and I like to do it that way. I don't like to like being a hurricane. I don't want to get all like new age, but it's kind of like a religious experience for me. And I don't like I don't like being around a lot of people talking. I like to just kind of connect with the experience, and I, I feel like I could do that best alone. But that means I have to do everything alone. I don't like a crew and stuff, unless I'm like shooting a TV show, in which case that's something else. But um, but because of that, uh, and also because keep in mind, I'm on a normal year, I'm just hopping around the globe, you know, on like connecting flight to connecting flight to some random island in the middle of the Pacific. So I have to keep things small and portable and light. So I travel with um, everything is about, it's, it's about accuracy, but also about portability. Um, basically my main device for collecting uh, data are Kestrel weather meters because they're small and portable. I carry about five or six of them with me. And what I try to do before a hurricane comes on shore, and now I'm gonna get like all nerdy, but I try to deploy them at different points in what I think is going to be the landfall zone to get sort of a multi-dimensional uh, sort of profile of the hurricane as it comes ashore. And like my best work in this area was there's a hurricane hitting the west coast of Mexico in 2018, actually just two weeks after Michael devastated the Florida panhandle. So it was called Willa and it was hitting Sinaloa, which is a, a, a sparsely, a lot of the coast of Sinaloa is very sparsely populated. I planted uh, sensors along the coast. One went through the left eye wall, one went through the right eye wall, one went through the eye with me. And afterward, it had this really cool pressure profile that, that, that told you all kinds of things about the hurricane and, and what had happened. Now, the reason this was important and useful is this was an area with no weather stations and there were no recon planes in the hurricane. 
uh, as it came ashore. So these data really were the only data that were available telling what happened at landfall, and it was useful to the National Hurricane Center as they did their post analysis. And that's my biggest thrill now. When I was younger, it was I was like an adrenaline junkie. It was just about being in like a crazy storm. Now. My big passion is is collecting data on these remote landfalls where there otherwise wouldn't be any data. That's a that that I was going to say that I, I recall Patricia. I think uh, I think you uh, helped with some data on that as well. Which uh, yeah. Patricia was the storm that uh, I think they measured. What was it? Two hundred at one point over two hundred mile per hour winds. Sustained winds measured by recon of 215 That's miles right. an hour, thing, which is the highest like in, in the history of any tropical cyclone anywhere, including the Western Pacific, I might add. People often talk about the Western Pacific is king, the, the storms there are stronger. Like, well, Patricia beat them all. Okay, so let's talk about this. We talked about all the big chases and all. Uh, what have been yeah, some of your bust? Have you... Oh. <laughs> You have to have at least one or two in there that that drive you crazy all the time. Oh, yeah. You know, we all have them. And it's like I, you know, I take busts really hard. You know, I'm a very competitive guy and I'm very obsessive about I told you I see chasing as like a sport. I'm really into like my my records and my stats. And when I bust, I, you know, it, it, it's like, you know, I'm like I'm like the the you're losing Wimbledon in five sets in the final. I mean, I take it really hard. And when I, like my last bad bust was actually Matthew in the Bahamas in 2016. I don't bust often. And uh, yeah, oh, I'll, I'll be like depressed and sulking for days afterward. But a bust for me is when I miss the the core of the hurricane. So when I miss like what I call the eye wall. I like to get it in the eye, but as long as I get in the eye wall, that strong part, and I can collect meaningful data, then I feel like, okay, this was a worthwhile chase. But um. I think probably my worst ever was uh, I was in San Antonio visiting a friend and there was something popped up in the Gulf. It was Don of like 2011, I think. But it was one of those things. It was like a July tropical storm and it started to look really good. And we're like, hey, yeah, let's drive to the coast and do that. We went down to Baffin Bay and the thing <laughs> just like it kind of like just totally fell apart. Like the radar had the center, like you know, when one place and satellite imagery had it, and another, it just literally the whole thing just like it just. It just and you know, what? it probably got dry air coming off of the uh, the mountains, and that can happen there on those deep South Texas storms. Just ate the whole thing up. Yeah. So so, so the um, basically, but we were in Baffin Bay waiting for it. The center cast right over. I think I had like a two millibar pressure drop, and there was maybe a gust to like thirty miles an hour it was and and for like literally for months even years later like folks online like were trolling me about it like every like people would bring it up as like a low blow in debates like they would because i was so embarrassed about oh, it oh come on that's not <laughs> right all right well let's talk about uh some of the other projects you have going on first of all you did uh produce a documentary hurricane man people can uh, yeah. Where can people so, see that? Yeah, so Hurricane Man. So actually, I did not produce it. I was just the the talent in it. But um, it's a it's it's a, it was a British documentary produced by BBC. You've all heard of BBC and UK TV, which is a, a British television network. So it's a, a, a docu series called Hurricane Man, and um, it, it follows me uh, and a British film crew around the world as I hunt down hurricanes. So. Yeah, a British producer just came to me and said, you know, let's like make this show. And uh, so we produced it. I was very worried in the beginning. I was with, you know, just I was put with this crew of like a bunch of these really nice, like kind of tea drinking British hurricane virgins. None of them had ever been in a hurricane. And I'm like, OK, like I'm like, how are they going to handle this? Well, listen, at the end, all these all these uh, newbies, they all went through the eye wall of a category five. They all went through uh, Michael and I'll tell you, they did great. They all, they, none of them freaked out. They all, they, they, they did a really good job. So yeah, so it me around the world and it, it's a really good documentary because it doesn't just follow me, but in each impact, um, one crew um, sort of rides out the storm with a local family and another crew rides it out with emergency services. And then one's with me as I'm hunting it down to get data. So each episode, 
interweaves the, the different perspectives on the storm. And it happens in the Philippines, Mexico, the United States, just everywhere, Japan. So it's really cool. So uh, it, it aired on the Science Channel in the United States. Now you can get it on Amazon. Just uh, go to Amazon Prime, Google Hurricane Man. Yeah, it's a great series. Okay, and so we're, we're in podcast world here. Zach and I have been producing these. Everybody's doing a podcast, you know, why not? Uh, and we were talking the other day, you have something similar uh, that you're gonna begin. Yeah, so I'm launching a live stream. So it's iCyclone Live. So iCyclone is my brand name that I, I, I have been working under for years. It's my, my social media handles and everything else. iCyclone, the letter I, the word Cyclone. So on my YouTube channel, I'm now gonna be starting a live stream uh, that'll happen regularly. I have to assess how regularly but basically, I thought it would be a good uh, platform. I have very high social media engagement. I have a lot of like, you know, several hundred thousand followers on Twitter and Facebook. And I get a lot of questions and people want to engage in conversation. And I can't always get to everything. And I thought this would be a good way to make myself more accessible, uh, you know, to kind of go more in depth about like past chases or what I'm planning on doing. And most importantly, just to interact in real time, you know, with with uh, folks who follow what I do and who want to just, you know, really ask questions and get more in depth. You know, I think uh, you can't always give an interesting or in depth answer in a tweet. So this is this is designed to sort of, I guess, round out my, my sort of my communications. I'm very excited about it. So first uh, session of it, the first episode is going to be June 17th at 7 central so yeah uh just uh, check out my youtube channel uh just uh, go go to youtube and just look for ice cyclone you'll find it and uh, yeah please join in uh, i'll answer questions about almost anything almost <laughs> well I, okay so i don't know about you i mean we're all hurricane weather junkies here i'll be the first to admit though that after 27 28 years of it i'm not always looking forward to hurricane season zach's ready this guy is like, I mean, as soon as there's like a whiff of a spin anywhere, he's like, look at this, David, look at this. And, and you're, 50, you're 50 times worse. And so we know that, Josh. And, and so, but, but just to conclude here, Zach and I wanted to know, what do you do in the off season, you know, with all this energy? How do you get your a, a adrenaline kick? It's a great question. So, so in a, in a, in a, ideal year there's no off season because you know when it shuts down for the northern hemisphere then it's like it's hurricane season in australia they call them cyclones but you know and, and in fiji and places like that but this year yeah no i had like a real off season and uh you know what's interesting is i'm i'm really hardcore adrenaline junkie and like you know i'm really hardcore about hurricanes i'm not as hardcore about other things like people are like oh do you want to go skydiving i'm like no um yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, doing that. I'm kind of a wimp about it's like it's like I, I seem to have like when it comes to hurricanes i'm like this daredevil but when it comes to other things i'm kind of not you know i don't like heights like i'm just kind of you know i'm sort of a creature of routine i try to really get back into really tip-top shape in the off season i look at chasing it's like being an athlete and i think that you do better if you're like you know physically just like in really good condition and everything because chasing's hard on your body you know and your mind you know you're going days and days without sleep you know it's just i've been in situations whether i'm rescuing people or whatever where actually the physical strength matters so i just try to keep in really really good shape and enter the season like an athlete just primed and ready to go well, and Josh, I think everybody, it, everybody listening, they're most of them probably going to be local. You know, they're probably all wondering, are you coming back to the Gulf Coast this year to stay uh, for this? Oh, that's right. Season? That's right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, Mississippians, but I'm like gum stuck to you too. Okay, I am coming back. <laughs> no, I love it. Like, it's seriously, I'm really, I'm like, and I love Bay St. Louis. It's like, it's like my town. I'm really excited. I'm coming back on the 24th. I'll be back in what I call Hurricane House, which is the little, little cottage that I rent. Well, you're not the only one that loves Bay St. Louis and uh, the Gulf Coast. It's uh, very popular with folks in New Orleans. They've got homes over there. And of course, uh, the communities there, they're proud people and they know hurricanes. Uh, that is for sure. Oh, totally. I mean, I was going to say that as a hurricane nerd in L.A., you're really it's a lonely life. Like 
people in LA don't know the difference between a hurricane or a tornado. They're like, what's a hurricane? Is that rain? Like they like literally do not know. And it's not that they're dumb. It's just because everyone knows their environment. If you talk to a random Angelino about earthquakes, they could start telling you about S waves and P waves. You know, we all know our worlds. But the nice thing about living in Mississippi is you can talk to any random person off the street and they're actually like a hurricane nerd and they can share two or three really interesting experiences that they've had, I mean, or what their grandparents had. It's like everyone there can have a really cool, interesting discussion about hurricanes. So it gives me an automatic way to just like, you know, make friends. Well, Josh, uh, it was great having you here today. I'm glad we were able to catch you before the season uh, gets off and running. Uh, thank you so much for being on the podcast and stay safe and we'll see what this year has to offer. Well, those were some pretty harrowing stories from Josh Morgan. Uh, what a hurricane chaser indeed. And uh, as we noted, he's going to be back along the Gulf Coast this year based in Bay St. Louis. Uh, that was the correct spot for last year. Let's just hope it's a matter of convenience for this year uh, for him to jump off to other spots in the United States if, in fact, we do get hit. Uh, I don't know about the omen of him being there two years in a row, though. I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's probably going to become a regular thing, so we're going to have to get used to him coming to Hurricane House in Bay St. Louis, but hopefully Zeta was just an anomaly and uh, he has to chase the storms and they don't chase him. Right, and don't forget, of course, Laura and Sally and everything else that uh, was on either side of us. Well, next week, uh, Zach, the National Hurricane Conference is here in New Orleans. Now, normally this is in the spring. They put it off toward June because of COVID and the easing of restrictions. Obviously, it's risky doing a hurricane conference in the month of June uh, here in New Orleans. But I'm going to be speaking to Dr. Phil Klotzbach. And a lot of folks may have heard his name over the years. Uh, he was uh, the understudy for Dr. Bill Gray, who was really the pioneer in forecasting uh, hurricanes, seasonal hurricane forecasting. He passed away a few years ago. And Dr. Klotzbach at Colorado State is continuing that tradition. So I'm going to talk to him about about what he's seen so far. We've all seen the forecasts out there, uh, and I think he would take note of the same thing. It's not really until we get into July that we start to see the patterns setting up across the Western Hemisphere, over the oceans, and over the North American continent that could influence what kind of season we're going to see. Yeah, when it's this early in the season or preseason, when you're in April and May, when his first uh, numbers come out, it's typically he's generating them mainly from La Nina, El Nino. And what are we going to see with that? Uh, but once you get into the season, now that we're moving into the season um, and we get into July and especially early August, you start to see how this all plays out. And you also start to get hints of what the tracks might be uh, for that year where the hot spots could be. Louisiana was obviously the hot spot in 2020. Hopefully this year. We are not that hot spot. Um, even though we are going to have an active season, it doesn't mean we're really going to get threatened at all, but you always got to be prepared for that one. And we'll see what happens. Maybe it won't be an active season. Uh, there are years That's where the true. forecast uh, has not worked out, and uh, maybe this will be one of them. But as always, we want all of our uh, listeners out there to be prepared for whatever uh, may come our way. For Zach Fridella, I'm David Bernard. Thanks for listening and watching, and we'll see you here next week on Episode 10.